There have been more works written on the American Civil War than there have been days since it ended. And the number of topics? Overwhelming. However, one aspect of the military experience has largely been overlooked. Hidden from families and posterity, a topic as timeless as war itself. This episode, Sex and the American Civil War. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there, to show that history is indeed a story. When discussing the American Civil War, with regularity, stories emerge about the grand, the brave, the heroic, of patriotic fervor and endeavor. Yet, we must remember that the common denominator in all those stories is the human element. Human beings, in the midst of a life-changing event, filled with human emotions and needs— Capable of the unbelievable, and yes, the believable, which include all the fallacies that come with being human. Now that being said, the overwhelming majority of all who participated in the conflict might agree with one Confederate private by the name of Bumpus, who said, Uncontaminated I left home, and so I expect to return. The question must be asked just how many indeed returned uncontaminated. Retired psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry at the University of California at San Francisco, Dr. Thomas P. Lowry, addressed one falling from grace element in his 1994 book entitled The Story the Soldiers Wouldn't Tell, Sex in the Civil War. It seems he is no stranger to this unusual universe of study, for other works he has authored include Curmudgeons, Drunkards, and Outright Fools, Court Marshals of Civil War Colonels, Venereal Disease and the Lewis and Clark Expedition, and the Civil War Bawdy Houses of Washington, D.C., Now, please do not think that the American Civil War offered the first occasion for sexual activity. No, that's been around since the creation of man. And don't be surprised that men who led others into battle devised not only battle strategies, but moral strategies to wage war against moral inadequacies. For example, during the French and Indian War, British officer Major General Edward Braddock, in planning his July 1755 march to Fort Duquesne, limited his troops to a maximum of six women per company. In the War for Independence, the British occupation force in America was allowed one woman for every ten men. By the end of the war, that ratio narrowed to one woman for every four men. And you may be surprised which city led the colonies as a center for prostitution. Boston. Colonial morality was, in fact, the study of Daniel Scott Smith, who analyzed the records of two New England towns and whose documentation began for both in 1650. Smith found that in that year, about 8% of all brides were already pregnant, 15% by 1700, 35% by 1760. Now, it dropped to 10% by 1840, but jumped to 25% by 1865. His analysis? In times of crises, well, it serves as a catalyst for premarital sex. Those same troubling times at mid-19th century as well, as a push for universal education, contributed to an avalanche of letter writing during the Civil War. 
Therefore, we know so much more about those who fought in that conflict than any time before. So much writing that it contributed to a national paper shortage. And in some instances, we were allowed insight into areas never before addressed. For example, one correspondent wrote that Washington City was the most pestiferous hole since the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. A soldier from New Hampshire in 1864 wrote home to an acquaintance that at City Point, Virginia, we cannot get anything here but fornication, and that is plenty. And not only in letter writing, but in contemporary publications. You see, sex had become a literary phenomenon. Take Irish surgeon William Haynes, who immigrated to New York and published an American edition of the steamy novel Fanny Hill. From the money he made, this paperback writer, if you will, published more. Three survive. The Libertine Enchantress, The Secret History of a Votary of Pleasure, and The Love Feast. Today, all are in the Kinsey Institute Library in Bloomington, Indiana. And another development, an invention, allowed for topics and mediums that few could imagine when first introduced. The camera and photography. Daguerreotypes, which came along in 1841, evolved into calotype. Then in 1851, the ambrotype was followed by the tintype. Regardless, in those days, photography was considered an art, and many were eager to develop their artistic bend. Case in point, by 1861, there were 2,879 photographers alone in Paris, and in London, 200 schools taught photography. It didn't take long for nudes to become a medium for photographic art and their images for business. That element was boosted in 1854 when A.E. Desdary developed the carte de visite, a single exposure in eight photos. At their height, 300 million a year were sold in England alone. Now, commercial pornography was not new for our Civil War. As early as 1846, one historian with a camera, Roger Fenton, saw opportunity. He photographed nudes, as did the illustrator of Pilgrim's Progress and Robinson Crusoe, John Watson. As did Reverend Charles Lutwidge Dodson, better known as the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and its sequel, Through the Looking Glass. Though Dr. Lowry believes pornographic photography was quite popular in the 1850s, he also believes that the American Civil War cut into the market for securing new photos or models. What was sold then, he believes, was more on file, so to speak. Now, a soldier in camp could purchase what was called barracks favorites, which were inexpensive novels of a sexual nature. And of course, photographs of nudity were available and were purchased by both enlisted men and officers. 12 by 15 inch pictures were sold for $1.20 a dozen or 12 cents for a single image. Usually the images were of nude women doing innocent things. Images of female nudes engaged in actual sexual activity were usually not white more times than not, either black or Native American. If you did not dare own or carry a pornographic photo on your person, well, there were other options. One, a peep show. And if merely looking at a nude did not suffice, then one had plenty of opportunities to experience firsthand the world's oldest profession. Any major city was wide open. And in the North, that meant, in wartime, the nation's capital teemed with bawdy houses filled with prostitutes for every class and range of price. A few words about prostitutes. In 1858, Dr. William Sanger, who practiced in the Venereal Disease Hospital on Blackwell's Island, New York, persuaded 
some 2,000 prostitutes to complete a questionnaire. He found that 88% of those he questioned were under 30, 40% were under 20. His follow-up showed that most died of VD, or alcoholism, within four years after entering the profession. 62% were foreign-born, and of those, 57% were Irish, 20% German, and 8% English. Sanger tabulated that one of every 250 immigrants became a prostitute. 30% of those he surveyed had a child, and nearly all those children died before reaching school age. He estimated New York City had some 7,900 prostitutes among its 1.2 million. And that statistic did not escape the attention of one Bishop Matthew Simpson, who asked his congregation, Are you aware that there are more prostitutes than Methodists in our city? But back to Washington City, and it's some 61,000 who populated the city in 1861. Most of the Civil War's bawdy houses existed in a federal triangle that today would constitute the Customs Service, the IRS, and Justice Department buildings. Within 13 blocks of unadulterated vice, low saloons, brothels, hideouts for pimps, thieves, and pickpockets. Were well, today's National Museums of History, Natural History, and National Gallery now stand? Then was an open sewer, the Washington Canal. A 15th, most of the streets in the National Capitol were unpaved. The area between present-day Constitution and Pennsylvania Avenues, then known as Laos Alley, Rum Row, and Murder Bay, all were home to gamblers, thieves, and prostitutes. Now, just as in society, there were classes of prostitutes. The poor were found in Murder Bay. The younger and more beautiful ladies of the evening were found in Marble Alley, and that was between Pennsylvania and Missouri Avenues. Almost all the brothels sold illegal liquor, and their names rivaled anything any Madison Avenue ad man might come up with. Some of the names include Fort Sumter, The Ironclad, Headquarters, USA, The Devil's Own, The Wolf's Den, The Cottage by the Sea, Number 10, Marble Alley, The Haystack, The Blue Goose, Madame Wilton's Private Residence for Ladies, and Madame Russell's Bake Oven. By 1862, there were some 450 houses, and by 1863, the city had an estimated 5,000 prostitutes with half working in the Georgetown, Alexandria area. The provost guard listed 73 houses along with their addresses and actually raided them. One Union commander in particular tried to get a handle on the dilemma, and that officer may surprise you given his Civil War reputation, Joseph Hooker. From the West Point class of 1837, he was known to Mexican ladies during the Mexican War as El Capitan Hermoso. And while we're here, let's clear something up. Though it's a great story, there is no evidence to his name and the origin of the term hooker. In truth, the term had been used as early as 1845. But back to his efforts. Hooker tried to localize the problem and did so by herding many into the Murder Bay area, which then became known as Hooker's Division, or the Division. The area existed until 1914, when Congress finally stepped in and had it demolished. The federal district itself tried to help. The Capitol formed a police department in 1861. 150 men were to patrol 230 miles of streets and 77 miles of alleys at $1.31 a day. They did get help from the United States Military Provost Guard and even the newly created Secret Service. Now, since the prostitutes not only contributed to moral but military decay, 
Lafayette Baker of the Secret Service and others came up with an ingenious plan. The ladies in question, called Cyprians, as in pertaining to Cyprus, which was a center for worship of Aphrodite, made up one of the two most ardent nests of secessionists in Washington City. The other secessionist group, interestingly enough, were Episcopalians. Well, officials couldn't do anything about them, but did conspire to deal with the ladies of the evening. Many were herded together and sent south to the Confederacy. I might mention, however, that three months after one such shipment, a few were returned with the accompanying note. Sir, I send back to you two strumpets. And speaking of those that returned the goods, in the Confederate capital of Richmond, things were quite similar. The center of social life there was the four blocks southwest of Capitol Square. And two particular hot spots, the Ballard at 1400 and 1406 East Franklin, and the Exchange across the street at 1403 Franklin. A pedestrian bridge joined the two. In that same area, 40 major gambling houses with high-class harlots living above them and along the alleys. One notorious strip was Locust Alley, which ran from Maine to Franklin in a block bounded by 14th and 15th Streets. And a mile east of downtown, along Maine and Cary, another area flowing with liquor and populated by alcoholics, whores, and pickpockets. All frequented saloons, hotels, restaurants, and strolled late in the day on the city's most popular promenades. The YMCA there tried to establish a moral beachhead on South 10th Street, but immorality answered with a madam who opened her own house directly across the street and naming her establishment Duval's Drugstore. Just to the south, Petersburg, Virginia, was another haven for shady females and fleshpot sites. No surprise here, but sex was rarely included in letters home or in polite conversation. Yet it was not uncommon to find column-length advertisements for venereal remedies on front pages of daily papers. Those same papers also included police columns of obscene details from body house raids. Here's a letter from one Confederate who did bring up the topic, but with obvious embarrassment. He wrote home, We have a good spring of water, and the health of our regiment is good, except some disease that I feel a delicacy in spelling them out to you, as you are a female person. But however, I reckon you can't blush at little things during these times. It is the pox and clap. The cases of this complaint is numerous, especially among the officers. And by the way, Company A has got one officer toiling with the pock and one private with the clap. I now drop the subject as I have no idea it will interest you to be reading about that. Another who tried to relate the reality of things was a Tar Heel, who in a fall 1863 letter wrote about a lewd woman found in Petersburg. He wrote, John, about two weeks ago, there was a woman come up from Petersburg and stopped about 200 yards from our camp. Several of the boys went up and had lots of fun with her. It was about drill time, and one of the boys missed drill, and they put him on double duty. Now, letters like these, as we've mentioned, are rare. You see, the Victorian code of the period made it an extremely touchy topic for those at that time and its immediate descendants. But yet here's another soldier who gave advice to his wife about all the poisons of camp. Drunkenness, stealing, card playing, profanity, and whoring. Don't never come here as long as you can keep away, for you will smell hell here. Other southern cities that provided the same whiff included Chattanooga, Atlanta, Mobile, and New Orleans. But Richmond, as far as the Confederacy was concerned, was the flesh mecca. Little was ever done to regulate it all in Richmond, but in the western theater of the war, in Nashville, Tennessee, the so-called Athens of the South, there was innovation. 
The capital of Tennessee was a city of 14,000 non-slave citizens. It had a major university, medical school, excellent system of high school and academies, 30-plus publishers and journals. But if there was Athens in Nashville, there was also Amsterdam. Down the hill was Smoky Row. It stretched two blocks wide and four blocks long. Eight full blocks of prostitution. And by June of 1860, 207 identified harlots. The youngest was 15. The oldest, 59. And the mean age, 23. From remarkable records, the typical Nashville Cyprian in 1860 was around 30, widowed with small children, lived and worked in a two-room crib, and was one step away from absolute poverty. The influx of armies to the city, both Confederate and Union, meant lots of chances for horizontal refreshment. So much so that by the winter of 1862-63, the United States Army shipped under guard some 1,500 to Louisville, Kentucky, but most returned. A second attempt occurred August the 3rd, 1863, but while the white harlots were in transit up on the Ohio River, black prostitutes cornered the market. In response, the city of Nashville and one union officer in particular tried to come up with a novel solution. Lieutenant Colonel George Spaulding helped to launch the first American exercise in legalized prostitution. By April the 30th, 1864, 352 harlots were licensed in Tennessee's capital city, and 92 that had been diagnosed with some form of VD were receiving treatment in a facility erected for that very purpose. The license recorded name and address and assured that a surgeon duly appointed by a board of examiners had examined each and found them clean. Those examinations were required every week. The city went so far as to construct a hospital to treat those infected, and each licensed harlot paid 50 cents a week for its upkeep. That facility was hospital number 11 of 23 operated by the United States military. There was a male facility as well, hospital number 15, the Soldiers Syphilitic Hospital. Both were remarkably successful. Now, if one did not have a license and was caught, that individual was arrested and jailed for not less than 30 days. Nashville was not the only city to be innovative. After Memphis was captured by Union forces June 6, 1862, it too became a huge Union military center, and that ensured that the north side of Beale Street became a den of iniquity. The second experiment in regulation occurred here. These two cities, Nashville and Memphis, were the only ones to try such experiments until the state of Nevada acknowledged the obvious. Now, there is an old adage you cannot legislate morality. Perhaps, but in those two cities in Tennessee, public order was restored, disease reduced, and prostitutes, their clients, and the city benefited. As an aside, as of 1994 in prostitution-regulated Nevada, amongst licensed prostitutes, there had not been one reported case of AIDS. No surprise that cities in the North and South with a military presence were nests for prostitution. But there was another venue on rivers and waterways where steamboat passengers were 75% male. Some steamboat lines not only arranged for onboard prostitutes, but paid their fare. Those plying their avocation were restricted to dine alone to move about only on certain decks, and were usually assigned to staterooms abaft the side wheels. And on occasion, steamboats were asked to carry curious cargo. In 1863, the newly christened Idaho transported a shipload of harlots from Nashville bound for Louisville. Its captain, John Newcomb, was in charge, and upon his arrival, he learned that Louisville was not about to accept his cargo. So we tried Cincinnati, and that city refused as well. 
So Newcomb sat on the Idaho with all those ladies for 13 days until finally he received orders to return to Nashville. Newcomb and the steamboat company, after finally ridding itself of its human cargo, invoiced the United States government $5,000 for damages to the steamer and for feeding 150 women for a month. It was turned down. A personal visit by Newcomb to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton in 1865 finally resolved the issue. Well, thus far we've looked at one of the most obvious sexual outlets in time of war, prostitution. And now, a consequence, birth control. There were six major types at the time. Coitus interruptus, coitus reservatus, condoms, douches, sponge, and abortion. Condoms at that time were made from the dried gut of sheep. Rubber condoms were not introduced until 1876, and strangely enough, at the Philadelphia World Exposition. Douches were made with alum, zinc, vinegar, or baking soda. Sponges were in great demand by northern women since most came from the Confederacy's Florida. For abortion, one potion consisted of a mixture of myrrh, aloes, whiskey, sugar, vinegar, iron dust, ivy, and Seneca snake root. In 1840, there was an estimated one abortion for every 30 live births. In 1870, one for every five. And as to birth rates themselves, in 1800, the average American woman gave birth to 7.04 children. In 1900, 3.56 the sharpest drop, interestingly, came in the 1850s. At this point, we should comment on the status of Civil War medicine, the treating of conditions resulting from childbirth, birth control, and sex. For the record, anesthesia had been discovered about 15 years before the firing on Fort Sumter. Dr. William Morton used ether. Dr. Crawford Long used nitrous oxide. Chloroform was a favorite. Sadly, too late to benefit the hundreds of thousands who were wounded. Three pioneers, Louis Pasteur's discoveries in 1866 about the spread of disease by microorganisms, Joseph Leister, who one year later discovered that carbolic spray was effective in protecting wounds from gangrene. Those two discoveries brought a surgical revolution. Then in 1878, German bacteriologist Robert Koch advanced medical treatment with his discoveries on bacteria's role in wound infection. As to the actual study of medicine and education for prospective doctors, it is interesting to note at that time that Harvard received its first stethoscope in 1868, 30 years after its invention. That institution's first microscope in 1869. To further highlight the woeful conditions for medical training and practice, at the beginning of the American Civil War, the U.S. Army had only 20 thermometers, and those in power did little to rectify the situation. In 1863, the United States Senate refused to spend more than 18 cents a day for food for soldiers in U.S. hospitals. That same year, the House defeated a measure that would have provided trained cooks for the Army. When Dr. William A. Hammond, the Army's Surgeon General, proposed an ambulance corps, that was vetoed by Secretary of War Stanton and then General-in-Chief Henry Halleck. A dilemma indeed for those in need, like those suffering from venereal diseases. Just as there are the 128 volumes that make up the official records of the War of the Rebellion, there was also a medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. From its content, we know that VD was more prevalent at the first and end of the war. The most likely to fall victim was young, recently recruited, native-born, probably away from home for the first time, a non-combatant, and stationed near a city. It has been estimated that in the first year of the war, one of every 12 Union soldiers suffered from VD. The annual rate in the United States Army was 82 per 1,000. 
According to the medical and surgical history, in the Union Army from May 1st, 1861 to June 30th, 1866, there were 73,382 white cases of syphilis and 123 deaths. 6,207 black cases of syphilis, 28 deaths. There were 95,833 white cases of gonorrhea, 6 deaths. 7,060 black cases, 1 death. And there were 13,564 white cases, 7 deaths from orchitis, 990 black cases, 3 deaths. Already noted, one of the two greatest STDs of the period was the Neisseria gonorrhea bacteria. Its symptom, painful urethral discharge and the infection of the cervix in women. It wasn't until 1879 when it finally was identified under a microscope, and one had to wait until 1945 for effective treatment. More common and deadly was syphilis, which is caused by the bacteria Treponema palatum. It was visibly identified in 1905. The first blood test was designed two years later. When first diagnosed, treatment in the 18th century usually consisted of salts of mercury, which prompted a graffiti artist in a London bathroom to write, A night with Venus, a lifetime with mercury. Regardless of century, its primary stage, small, painless ulcers usually located on the genitals. Several weeks later, the secondary stage, a transient fever and a rash, which would clear up. The patient might feel better for years, but inevitably came the third stage. Infection ate away at the brain, blood vessels, and vital organs. Now, the spirochetes of brain syphilis could be killed, but adding insult to injury, it took a malarial fever to do such a thing. Another issue of sex that has been a hot topic as of late, homosexuality. One of the most well-known, the nurse and poet, Walt Whitman. The term itself, homosexual, was not introduced until 1895, gay in the 1950s. We have no record of any soldier discipline for homosexuality, but three pairs of Union sailors were court-martialed in 1865. We have only one case of male prostitution that was reported during the war. The Richmond Dispatch reported on May the 13th, 1862, of prostitutes of both sexes openly displaying themselves in carriages and on sidewalks. Walt Whitman wrote on many occasions that so-and-so slept with me. But one has to be careful with that term during that period of time. For example, it is well known that Lincoln slept with men, most notably Joshua Speed from 1837 to 1841 in Springfield, Illinois. But then again, sleeping with another of the same sex was quite common then. It was a thing of necessity at crowded stagecoach stops and drafty inns. As far as sex went with Lincoln and his wife, we have evidence that the two may well have ceased sexual activity after the 1853 birth of Tad, Mary Todd suffering with some serious gynecological problems. We do know that Lincoln did invite a captain from Company K of the 150th Pennsylvania Cavalry, his escort, to share his blankets when Mary was away. Now, as suspicious as all this sounds, it appears to have been nothing out of the ordinary at that time. Mr. Lincoln simply wanted company, as did some who had stars on their shoulders and collars and with different intent. Enter Union Cavalry Officer Judson Kilpatrick. Though he did not drink or play cards, he was a notorious Don Juan. Both Dr. R. Blacknell of Durham Station and James H. Miller of Raleigh testified that Kilpatrick had a woman with him throughout the Carolinas campaign. His lady, an itinerant Southern belle, was nicknamed Charlie, 
And at Monroe's Crossroads, North Carolina, in March of 1865, Wade Hampton and his Confederate mounted men surprised Kilpatrick at his headquarters, rousting the Union general and Charlie in their underwear. It wasn't only officers, either. One 17-year-old Anna E. Jones of Cambridge, Massachusetts, moved to Washington in 1861 to become a nurse. Denied because she was too young, she decided to attend to the sexual needs of Union generals. Six of them, including Franz Siegel, Judson Kilpatrick, and George Armstrong Custer. There is a Confederate version of Judson Kilpatrick, Earl Van Dorn. So much so that at Spring Hill, Tennessee, on May the 7th, 1863, Van Dorn's Civil War career ended abruptly when he was assassinated at his headquarters by a Dr. Peters who alleged that the Confederate general had violated the sanctity of his home. Speaking of such, then there's the drama of another Union general, Daniel Sickles. The Union general who went on to command the Third Corps of the Army of the Potomac passed the New York bar at age 21. At 28, he married 17-year-old Teresa Bagioli. By 30, he was in the New York State Senate where four years of shady deals, shameless corruption, bad debts, and immorality prepared him for the United States Congress. In 1859, his wife Teresa and the son of Francis Scott Key, Philip Barton Key, became lovers. Sickles, not enjoying the taste of his own medicine, first forced his estranged wife to sign a confession of guilt. Next, he stalked and murdered Key with three shots in broad daylight, in plain view near Lafayette Square in Washington City, and within sight of the executive mansion. Acquitted by reason of temporary insanity, the first in judicial history in this country, Sickles then said he forgave his wife. All this before the war ever began. His Civil War command added to the controversy that seemed to accompany him. After the war, he arranged an appointment as ambassador to Spain, where after four years of incompetence, he resigned to pursue a torrid affair with the deposed Queen Isabella II. But what of the common soldier? His sexual activity was most often with a harlot, and all were not necessarily professionals. We do know that some 250 women have been documented disguising their sex to enlist. True, the majority probably did so out of patriotic devotion. Some wanted to escape a past, some to follow loved ones, and yes, there were a few who saw entrepreneurial opportunity. Like Mary and Molly Bell, who spent two years in Jubal Early's Confederate unit. There, they were known as Tom Parker and Bob Morgan. The October 31st, 1864 Richmond Enquirer reported two females of questionable morality arrived in this city on Friday night by the central train in charge of a guard. They were dressed in Confederate uniforms and were sent to this city from southwestern Virginia, where they have been in service during the past two years. The Enquirer reported they were imprisoned and continued in prison for aiding in the demoralization of General Early's veterans. Despite all these stories, quite honestly, while campaigning, the common soldier had little opportunity to misbehave, except when in large cities and with too much free time. Recently recruited are on furlough. Many temptations did exist at recruiting centers and jumping off points like Chicago. New York City, Washington City, and Boston. Also in occupied cities like Louisville, New Orleans, Portsmouth, Norfolk, Savannah, Chattanooga, New Bern, North Carolina, and Cincinnati, where in January of 1864, one soldier wrote that the Femmes du Monde had, in his words, nearly succeeded in elbowing all decent women from the public promenade. Bell Irvin Wiley's classic research tells us that Union soldiers were more likely to contract VD than Confederate because there were simply more of them. They were better paid, had more generous bounties, 
and easier access to bigger cities. And although the Confederate common soldier may not have had the same opportunities as his Union counterpart, a Confederate report in July of 1861 showed 12 regiments of 11,452 men representing five different states. Well, they had 204 cases of gonorrhea and 44 of syphilis. That would translate into 17.8 cases of gonorrhea and 3.8 of syphilis per 1,000 men. Those numbers would decrease as the war progressed. That makes sense, as by that time, most were active in the field and not in cities. Yet, some habits and vices are hard to die. When the Grand Army of the Republic's 1895 National Encampment was held in Chicago, the Souvenir Sporting Guide advertised four theaters and 28 houses of prostitution, which leads one to think that just maybe someone could teach an old dog new tricks. It has been written that Robert E. Lee won so many battles that he lost the war. Our next episode chronicles perhaps the most glaring example. It may well have been Lee's greatest victory, but indeed, it was one that cost him, his army, and the Confederacy most dearly. Next time we gather, Chancellorsville. We at Threads from the National Tapestry are most pleased and most appreciative that in our ranks we now include an international patron. Haken from Gothenburg, Sweden, we are so very pleased that you enjoy what we are doing and we welcome you. Thank you so very much for your patronage. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening. This podcast is sponsored by Bob Grasser, Raleigh Civil War Roundtable's editor of the Knapsack Newsletter and the Roundtable's webmaster at raleighcwrt.org. That's raleighcwrt.org.